Uh, no, but, but seriously, we're, uh, we're really thrilled to have uh, Professor Josh Blackman here with us um, now. In this crowd, he probably doesn't need that much of a lengthy introduction, but uh, that won't stop us from giving him the, the kind of intro he deserves. Um, Josh is an Associate Professor of Law at the South Texas College of Law, Houston, and the author of the critically acclaimed, unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. He was selected... I'm sorry, did you guys want no light over you? No, it's fine. Okay, because it's completely... <laughs> you do whatever you want. Um, Josh was selected by Forbes magazine for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, founder and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, which I recommend you all play online and at home. Um, he blogs at the <laughs> eponymous <laughs> joshblackman.com. Leads cutting edge uh, is at the cutting edge of legal analytics as director of judicial research at Lex Predict. He is the author of over two dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, L.A. Times, and other national publications. Josh clerked for the Honorable Danny J. Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and for the Honorable Kim R. Gibson on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. He is a graduate of the George Mason University School of Law, and you can follow him at his witty Twitter account, at Josh M. Blackman. Thank you. Please Someone don't took at Josh Blackman, who that person is, he took my account, and has far few followers on you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at NYU. Tomorrow we're going to have a wonderful conference on Trump and the presidency. But believe it or not, before Donald Trump's inauguration, administrative law and the separation of powers was still a thing. And that's the funny thing about administrative law. People have a habit of reorienting themselves every four to eight years. That is, when the president in power enacts policy they like, they extol deference. When the president in power is someone they don't like, they seek strict judicial review. And I don't think there's anything hypocritical or bizarre about this. It's the very nature of how politics works. What I want to do here is illustrate some neutral principles of when presidential interference with the administrative process may not be desired. So let me lead off my talk today with a very recent example you may have heard about, bump stocks. Now, you probably never heard of a bump stock before a couple months ago. I never heard of it before a few months ago. Basic firearms. A machine gun, by definition, when you pull the trigger, many bullets come out, right? You spray, right? Just kind of a crime, it sprays bullets everywhere. That's automatic. A semi-automatic weapon, you pull the trigger once, a single bullet comes out. Since the 1930s, in the days of the Tommy gun, come on in. Since the 1930s, Congress has heavily regulated automatic weapons. They're basically impossible to get, you pay this huge tax. But semi-automatic rifles, at least in most free states, are readily available, not in New York anymore. So what's the difference between a semi-automatic weapon, an automatic weapon? When you press the trigger once, do many bullets come out? One bullet come out. Now the bump stock is a tool that was designed to evade this rule. I'm actually avoid this rule is a better word. The way it's constructed is it puts this mount on your shoulder. So when you pull the trigger once, the gun recoils and it flies forward and flies back. But so long as you keep your finger steady, the gun keeps moving and there are many trigger pulls, but you don't have to move your finger. So if I understand what's going on, right? This was designed in a very careful way to evade the ban of automatic weapons. It's not quite as fast as an automatic weapon, but it's close enough. I describe this to students as the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. You can avoid taxes, you can't evade them. So it's often a blurry line. So bump stops aren't new. And for years, the ATF, the Apple Tobacco and Firearms Bureau, considered can we prohibit bump stops as part of a machine gun? And to the surprise of many, I agree with it. The Obama administration said, we cannot regulate bump stocks 
under the machine gun statute. Why? Because no matter how the gun's moving, there are multiple pulls to the trigger. Even if your little finger, right, is not moving back and forth, there are multiple trigger pulls, and the statute doesn't consider this. Now, when Congress enacted these statutes decades ago, they didn't know what the hell bump stop was. They wouldn't have to because this was invented afterwards. But under the definition of the statute, there's no problem. Okay. Fast forward to 2017. You have a mass killing in Las Vegas. We have this nut job at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas shooting with a bump stop out of his window. Come on in, come on in. Shooting out of a bump stop out of his window, mowing down innocent people attending a concert. Yeah, most people have never heard of a bump stop before this. They heard of it now. So, as often is the case, when someone uses a new technology to commit an atrocity, you say, let's ban it. Okay. Would Congress have the power to ban bump stops? I'm going to put aside the Second Amendment for now, but under their commerce powers, no doubt, Congress could ban the sale and importation of bump stops that travel in interstate commerce. No. Did Congress enact the statute? No. So what happened next is a case study in what I call presidential maladministration. Not presidential administration, which is what Elena Kagan wrote in a very famous article. She called it presidential administration. I call it presidential maladministration. And I can describe a few in a very simple scene. A few weeks ago, President Trump had one of his listening sessions at the White House where members of Congress came to talk about gun control. And Senator Cornyn from Texas, my, my, my adopted home, I'm actually from Staten Island, if you didn't know it, I, I grew up here. Uh, I come back to Pace last every year, and this is why I'm, it's, it's, it's a well-timed trip. Uh, I'm going to North Dakota for Passover next week. That's not going to be easy. It'll be a lot easier here. So, <laughs> at this listening session, Senator Cornyn said, you know, we need to pass a statute to ban bump stocks. And Trump goes, no, 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 you don't need a statute, I'll do it by executive order. Oh, he didn't actually mean executive order, he meant rulemaking, but I'll put that, I'll leave, leave it aside now, right? He often says things he doesn't actually mean, or he means things, as, I don't know, don't take them literally, right? <laughs> so, Corn is like, let's pass a statute to regulate bump stocks. And then Trump goes, no, 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 don't need to do a statute, we can do this by executive order, meaning rulemaking. Shortly thereafter, I think about a week later, Right, a Friday afternoon, DOJ puts out this 50-page notice of proposed rulemaking, which purports to provide a new interpretation of a statute that's decades old. Even though the Obama administration ATF decided that you cannot fit a bump stop with a meeting of machine gun, the Trump ATF decided that now we can. Now, what do we make of this, right? A statute had been interpreted a long way by agencies who were not friendly to guns. Right? Obama was not, you know, the NRA said he was a good seller for the NRA, but he was not an advocate for gun rights. Yet his DOJ, which ATF is under, determined that bump stocks cannot be regulated. Now Trump, after this tragedy in Las Vegas, and after at this meeting, he says, you guys go regulate this by executive order. He says, let's have a rulemaking. Now, does anyone think this rulemaking matters? Will any of these comments make the slightest difference when the President of the United States has already announced the outcome? Of course not, right? They've made their decision. <clears throat> Soliciting comments is a waste of time. I'm going to spend a comment. I'm going to complain, right? Because when you spend a comment, you can intervene. But, oh, should have not the way I went. But, anyway, surprise. Uh, let them watch my stuff. But when you, when you put out this rulemaking, you listen, but the president directed this from the very top down. This rulemaking, which will be challenged in court, will test a number of principles, right? First, is the meaning of the machine gun statute ambiguous, right? It defines one pull of the trigger. Is that an ambiguous phrase? I don't think so. If somehow a court finds it's ambiguous, does it then go to Chevron deference? Is this the case that the court uses to roll back Chevron deference? Maybe. That'd be a fun case, right? But more pressingly, putting aside the Chevron issue, should deference be given on the same level when the president engages in what I call maladministration? Okay? And this takes several different 
forms. And I've already told you what they are, but I'll explain in detail. So the first species of maladministration I discuss is what I call a presidential reversal. A presidential reversal. What's this? President number one takes a position, and President two takes a different position. Right? The statute hasn't changed. Congress's intent hasn't changed. The legislative history hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed has been the president. Should courts defer to these presidential reversals? Now, we see this a lot at the US Supreme Court, where the incoming Solicitor General says, this is their quote, upon further reflection, the office has changed its position. Now, upon further reflection is code for upon further election, right? That after the change in administrations. And the Supreme Court gets pretty annoyed at this. In fact, back in 2009, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia were very uh, uh, antsy when the Obama DOJ said, oh, we're changing this position. And now it's just a Sotomayor complaining. It's the same thing. Everything just reverses at Trump. How do courts review this? So within the context of the Chevron doctrine, do I, you all know Chevron. I need to explain Chevron. Right? Within the, at NYU, I do not need to explain that. Right? Within the context of the Chevron doctrine, the courts have said reversals are fine. Why? The incumbent administration has expertise. And courts can rely on those revolving interpretations of statutes. So when you have an ambiguous statute, the courts are comfortable deferring to the agency expertise. Okay. But what about outside Chevron? That is where the statute is not ambiguous. It's actually quite the opposite. Courts express a skepticism at reversal. Now think of it this way, right? We're all constitutional originalists now, or we're supposed to be, right? But are we statutory originalists, right? We say, to interpret the Constitution, we ask, what did this term mean in 1791, right? How was this term understood in 1868? Why don't we do the same thing with statutes, right? How was this term understood in 1937 when the statute was enacted? This is, by the way, I've written a piece called Statutory Originalism about the Title IX and Transgender Bathroom issue. I'll put that aside for the moment. If we're right about this, right? If we can ascertain the meaning of a statute, then I submit that interpretations of the statute closer in time to when the statute was enacted should be more authoritative. That is, in a couple of years after the statute was enacted, the president and his administration should have read interpreting it, and then like 80 years later they change interpretation, the earlier in time one should control. And I think in this case, it's a, it's, a, it's a very tough position for Jeff Sessions because this interpretation of machine gun has been around for quite some time. And now, years later, after the president made his directive, issued his memo, made his pointing, and we do you, you, right? That's when they changed it. So I think in this case, so long as we're outside of Chevron, the court should not defer to this presidential reversal because the statute had a meaning which was well understood. And there's reason to suspect that this change in meaning was not because of a reasoned decision, but because of this, what I call, presidential maladministration. And just make one point clear. When we're talking about statutory interpretation of the APA, this is not about the president's Article II power. And I often get this pushback. If the president's interpreting this constitutional oath, I won't raise these arguments. I don't care about the APA for the president's oath of office. But when he's administering a statute that delegates authority, the APA is relevant. Okay, so you'll probably give me something different tomorrow with the travel ban, but I'm very, very keen on this point about this article too. Okay, this the second species of maladministration is what I call presidential discovery. This is where the executive branch has discovered a new power that they lacked before, and it's often the case where the government says we can't do this. Oh, but now we can. And I'll give you a very good example. FDA versus Brown and Williamson tobacco. So for decades, tobacco has had a very unique place in our administrative state, right? It's a drug, it's pretty dangerous for you, it'll kill you. But for the longest time, tobacco was not subject to the Food and Drug Act, right? It was basically exempt from almost all regulations, why? Tobacco's a good lobbyist. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't say it in blunt, any, more, any more blunt way, but tobacco had protection, they're good friends. Okay? But all of a sudden, in the 1990s, 
the Clinton administration came out and said, aha, we've discovered a way to take a decade-old statute and use it to regulate tobacco in a way that's never been done before. And in fact, President Clinton announced this rulemaking from the Rose Garden. I call this the Rose Garden rule, right? If you announce a regulation in the White House, it's probably going to be struck down, right? <laughs> Clinton said, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. He wasn't announcing a statute. He was announcing a notice of proposed rulemaking. And what the court found in opinion, which wasn't 9-0, it was divided, it was 5 4 six, three, is that President Clinton did not, or his FDA did not have the power to do this. That Congress did not delegate to the executive branch the power to regulate tobacco. This was a very important question, and Congress must speak with clarity. You can't infer this from silence and statutes. Um, that is, President Clinton tried to discover in an old statute the power to do something that was briefly disclaimed. Let me make that point again. For decades, the president said, I can't regulate tobacco under the statute. And then Clinton came along and says, I think for cigars are rough, but you know, he said, I can regulate tobacco. This is a discovery. When previous administrations said, no, we can't do it, new administration walks in and says, ah, I can do it. This old statute, I need a new statute. This fits to a paradigm, I think, what Trump did with the, um, with the bump stocks. I will give you another example, okay? Several years ago, I was here, and I gave a talk on Obamacare. And at the time, uh, lots of people were receiving cancellation notices, right? Their healthcare policy was being canceled. And President Obama had initially said that he didn't have the power to uh, uh, grant certain exemptions to the ACA. The statute didn't permit it. But then when stuff started getting really tough, he says, aha, I have now discovered the discretion to do it. Another example. The Affordable Care Act says to members of Congress, you can't get free government health insurance, you must go on Obamacare. That's like a good idea. But guess what? Members of Congress don't want to do Obamacare because it sucks. So they all lobbied the president, and they said, you need to create an exemption. Aha! The power was discovered to put members of Congress in these special non-Obamacare plans so they had absolutely no change in their premiums. Again, usually when you have this presidential discovery, there's no injury. Right? When the president's just spending money on Obamacare, this and that, no one's injured. But with the tobacco case, there was an injury. And with the bump stock case, there was going to be an injury. So these are ripe for litigation. Um, the third species of maladministration is not really relevant to uh, the bump stock issue, but I'll talk about it anyway. It is relevant to other aspects of Trump. And it's what I call presidential non-enforcement presidential non-enforcement. Uh, the Supreme Court has recognized that non-enforcement of a statute is subject to judicial review if the agency has, quote, consciously and expressly avoided a general policy, sorry, consciously and expressly adopted a general policy that is so extreme as to amount to an abdication of statutory responsibilities. Um, this is not the take care clause. I'm not, I'm not gonna take care, but under the APA, if there's non-enforcement, it may be subject to review. And there have been several instances in recent years where the law simply just has not been enforced. Uh, there was a so-called administrative fix under which the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act was just not enforced for millions of Americans. And guess what? Trump continued it, right? To this day, millions of Americans have never been subject to the mandate. Second, we have the Deferred Action Policy, DACA and DAPA. That is, DAPA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and DAPA is Deferred Action for Parents of American and lawful permanent residents, right? Um, and these deferred action policies followed a very particular cycle, what I call the five Ds. Deliberation, disclaimer, defeat, debate, and discovery. I'll walk through those in detail. Initially, with both DAPA and DAPA, President Obama says, I can't do this, right? I can't help the dreamers, right? I can't help parents of US citizens go to Congress, right? He said, he said, when Congress, I'm sorry, he says for Congress to do it. I call this deliberation. And there's a disclaimer. Congress can do it, not me. So you have deliberation and disclaimer. Okay. Then you have defeat. When the bills are defeated in Congress, that is Congress did not vote and approve the DREAM Act and the immigration reform, he says, aha, we have defeat. Then the president debates, can I do this? And they discover the power. So the, so the cycle is this. After Congress deliberates, and the bill's defeated, 
the president then discovers the power to do X. I'm very skeptical of this, right? You say, well, perhaps, Josh, he was saying, I can't do this because uh, if he says he can do it, then you won't need any sort of legislation, right? If the president said, you know what, I have this executive power, why would Congress pass a tough statute? That may be right, but maybe I'm Pollyanna, maybe I'm naive. When the president says, I lack the power to do X, constitutionally, that means something to me, right? When he says the president does not have the power, usually presidents don't disclaim their power. But when they do, I think that should count for something. In contrast, Trump with the bumps on, yeah, yeah, don't pass a statute, I give you an executive order. It's almost a mirror image <laughs> of what happened with immigration. Okay. The final species of presidential mal uh, mal uh, maladministration is what I call a presidential intrusion. Presidential intrusion. So with this species of maladministration, the White House uses its unique influence to change the decision-making process for independent agencies. Now, I will footnote this. I don't believe there's such a thing as independent agency. I don't know what that is, but the courts have a mouth, right? But assuming these agencies do exist and they're independent, the president can try to influence them. Now, the president can remove the heads of these agencies for cause, this is Humphrey's executor, but generally they're supposed to be insulated. So there's a very good example which concerns net neutrality, which happened a couple of years ago. Um, initially, the agency was leaning towards uh, uh, doing a partial uh, 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 net neutrality policy. Not everything activists wanted, but a, you know, a half measure approach. Uh, and then President Obama issued this video, YouTube video. It wasn't a notice and comment, but a video on YouTube saying, you need to go full net neutrality, do the entire thing. And then magically, within moments of Obama putting that video online, protesters show up at the house of the FCC commissioner and they block his driveway so he can't go to work. How on earth did these community organizers know to go to the guy's house at the same time this video's been released? Well, I, I couldn't tell you, I, I have no idea. But there's evidence internally that the White House's interference did affect their decision-making process. Now again, these people can't be removed, but they are, but they are aware, they, they, they react to pressure. Uh, fortunately, that process is dead because the Trump administration basically reversed it. It held the litigation for years, but we'll see what happens there. The bump stock thing is not exactly uh, uh, analogous because it's not an independent agency. DOJ and ATF are political appointees. But there's a lot of grumbling where people at ATF have spoken to the press on background and said that we don't think this is a good reg, the Obama reg was good, and we can't regulate bump stocks, we're gonna lose. But it doesn't matter. Trump announced it at the White House. He issued a memo directing them. This is a fait accompli. And we have this sort of rulemaking that normal reasons for deference are, are skeptical. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago the Kagan article. And back in the, was it 1990, uh, sorry, 2001, a president, uh, a then just, well, now justice, then Professor Kagan, wrote an article called Presidential Administration. And she wanted to revision administrative law through the lens of the president's personal influence on the regulatory state. To Kagan, Chevron deference was not grounded on the agency's expertise and experience. She said, rather, a sounder version of Chevron would take, quote, unapologetic account of the extent of a presidential involvement in administrative decisions in determining the level of deference to which they are entitled. Under this view, the court should apply a variable deference regime dependent on the role of the president in an agency's interpretive decision making. The stronger the president's fingerprints on executive action, the more courts should defer. Right? That was Kagan's position. Who was she? She was a White House lawyer. Right? She worked on the FDA, uh, the Brian Williamson case. She helped design that regulation. So Kagan said, when the president's involved, more deference. Why? The president, she explains, is politically accountable to the populace. Bureaucrats or not. And the president can use his influence to coordinate and use his influence to achieve ambitious regulatory goals within an otherwise ossified bureaucracy. Right? Very often, bureaucrats don't move. But when the president goes to the Rose Garden and announces the message from the top, okay, you get your marching orders. Now, Kagan wasn't too worried about this. She says if the executive ever goes too far, courts can check arbitrary and capricious activity. Well, that only works with their standing. And as we saw in the last eight years, very often there was not clear standing. 
So to Kagan, these parameters, apart from sort of technocratic expertise, should give courts comfort deferring to regulatory agenda. But my position of presidential maladministration is that there's a flip side to this. Um, High-level influence may be less salutary, where an incoming administration reverses a previous administration's interpretation of statute simply because a new sheriff is in town, court should verify if the statute bears such a fluid construction. Second, where an administration discovers a heretofore known power in a statute that allows it to confer substantive rights, court should raise a red, a red, court should raise a red flag, especially when that authority exercises one Congress withheld. Third, where administration declines to enforce a statute that Congress refuses to repeal. Under the guise of prosecutorial discretion, courts should do the action with skepticism. And finally, where evidence exists, the White House attempted to exert its influence and intrude into the rulemaking process of independent agencies, courts should revisit the doctrine concerning altered regulatory positions. Um, and I'm going to end with a, 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 an anecdote um, that uh, Adrian Vermeules, a professor at Harvard, advanced. Uh, he describes administrative law as a dance. And if you ever watched a movie based on Jane Austen novel, you know, they always have these two lines, one dancing parallel, right? And then, you know, at one point they clap, everyone switches sides, and they continue dancing as if nothing had happened. Um, and that's much the same with administrative law. Uh, before the election, you had a small group of people who were very skeptical of the administrative state. A lot of them are you know, backing off it, backing off it, backing off it. And you know, a lot of people say, we need to give Obama all the power in the world. Thank God, right? Now saying, oh God, Trump, we can't have Trump that power, right? Um, I have tried to preach this message consistently, I would hope, over the last several years, that whatever power you give to President A, um, President B can exercise it. And whatever you insulated from judicial review, the next president is also insulated from judicial review. Um, one of the most delicious ironies for me is standing. I argue that in U.S. v. Texas, the states had standing to challenge President Obama's immigration orders, right? I was criticized left and right. I took fire from every single side, right? Uh, amicus briefs were written that basically responded to things I discussed. You know what? Washington, which argued directly that states do not have standing to challenge the uh, deferred action policy, are now citing the opinions they lost in, right? The exact case, the U.S. v. Texas, they lost in, they're now citing this evidence that they can sue Trump over the travel ban, over DACA, or DACA, whatever it happens to be. So these principles are fluid. They move back and forth. Uh, but my, my parting words, and I'll stop here, is that whatever power you give to President A, uh, you give to President B. And I uh, thank you very much for attention, and we have a small group of having a discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, sir, back. Uh, Professor, I have a quick question. If you'd clarify something you said. <clears throat> uh, my apologies. When you, you said that the, that there was a contemporaneous interpretation of a statute, and then there's a latter reversal of the interpretation that the contemporaneous interpretation ought to be binding. Not, not binding, okay. but, but better. better. Okay, better. I, I see. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's my question. Yeah, no, I don't think it's, it's, it's better. But um, in terms of language, right, let's say when a statute's passed, people are generally aware of it. They're aware of the context that arose. That probably gives them a better insight into what they meant. Whereas if you try and visit it decades later, that institutional memory simply vanished. I don't think it's binding. And in fact, I think if, you know, uh, what Sessions has argued with his bump sock thing is that Obama was wrong. He said that we are actually giving the original interpretation. And he did something very smart. I don't know if anyone else noticed this. But he cited the issue of Oxford's English Dictionary for when the statute was passed, like the 1937 OED, right? Mr. Oxford here, right? Uh, <laughs> he cited all these old dictionaries saying, look, Obama was wrong. They've been wrong for decades. So he's actually somewhat addressing my point that we've had a flawed interpretation of the statute for decades, and we are the statutory originalists. <sighs> I don't know. I think it's a stretch. But, but yeah, but not binding, at least better. I will leave it there. Um, what role, if any, do you think that growing congressional gridlock plays into uh, commentators' desire, anyone's desire, for there to be presidential administration? 
Oh, what a very good question, right? So I've given a number of uh, speeches on gridlock over the years. In fact, that a piece in the Harvard Law Review um, by that exact name. Uh, during the Obama presidency, a common refrain was, well, because Congress won't take action, I have to go the executive order route. I have to go to the executive memorandum. Um, the temptation's real. And I think once Trump loses Congress, he'll do just the same. I don't think any president will be any different on this. Uh, the problem is that under our Constitution, when the parties don't agree, you have stasis, right? Gridlock, I don't see it as a problem. Uh, I see gridlock as what Madison described the Federalists as ambition, counteracting ambition. Um, and if you read the Noel Canning decision, a very important decision, this is about recess appointments. Um, Justice Scalia wrote a concurring opinion, really dissent, but it was basically a concurring opinion, where he said that intransigence, right, the fact that the Senate wouldn't confirm Obama's nominees was a feature and not a bug of our republic. That was his language, a feature and not a bug. So the fact that Congress can't get along is more of a reflection on our polity than it's a reflection on our constitution, right? If, if everyone hates each other and New York goes one way and Texas goes another and we have absolute gridlock, then you know, maybe we need a, need a republic, right? But <laughs> that's, not, that's not the basis for executive workarounds. Um, there was this very good uh, Saturday Night Live sketch about uh, how a bill becomes a law, right? And uh, it was related to Obama that built the law, and Obama keeps kicking the bill down the stairs, saying, oh, we'll just do executive order, right? Uh, you know, th that's, that's how these things sort of work. Um, but I don't think gridlock provides a license to evade the, uh, the, the regulatory process in the normal course. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. So, as to your first point, um, if a presidential, if a change in presidency uh, not only doesn't legitimate a change in interpretation, but calls it into question, um, then given that usually one of the things that's cited as a, as a reason for courts to defer is political accountability, what's left as a reason why, and I, I can understand there are some truly uh, technocratic interpretation matters, the Pitts case where it's, you know, how many dots on the lung is black lung or whatnot, but does the lack of presidential changeover as a, as a means to check presidential interpretations then call into question uh, whether or not courts should defer at all above a certain threshold? Or Right, so here's the question, all right? If we adopt my position in the extreme, then whoever is the first sheriff in town gets a chisel to stone, right? So let's say a statute's enacted when President Carter's in office, and um, President Reagan comes in has a different interpretation. Ah, Carter did it, we're done. Right? I am not averse, to be very careful, I don't think reversals are a bad thing always, but the statute must bear that construction. Right? If the statute, in fact, is ambiguous, I'm okay with Chevron deference saying we'll defer to the incumbent administration, because maybe Congress would have wanted the incumbent administration to interpret differently. I'm okay. But outside Chevron, if the statute can't bear that change interpretation, then there should not be that sort of deference. So it's really, my, my thesis hinges, are we in Chevron's domain or are we outside of it, right? Um, and in Chevron itself, I mean, we all know the case name, the facts of it, what happened. The Carter administration interpreted the Clean Air Amendments one way, and then Reagan came and said, screw that, no, we're not gonna do this, we're gonna do this differently, like, we want more pollution, whatever, right? <laughs> we, 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 we wanna change the, we wanna re reinterpret how stationary sources are, uh, understood for purposes of the Clean Air Act. I think I got that mostly right. Um, and they interpreted it differently. There were other cases involving seatbelts. Remember those passive restraint things, right? Remember you get into a car and seatbelt like close on, you, close on your neck? Carter had it one way, Reagan another. I'm okay with that so long as the statute bears that meaning. But when the statute doesn't, like this bump stop thing, I don't think you can change it merely because you're incumbent. That I think is problematic. Yes, sir. Looking for a little clarification on the point on um, the standing and arbitrary and capricious. And so uh, you said from Kagan's article that uh, arbitrary and capricious would work fine for new regulations, you know, if there was standing to do it. And I'm wondering then is, are all these four prongs of influence and um, discovery just then arbitrary and capricious factors? If so, is there an additional one that wouldn't be an yeah. arbitrary and capricious analysis? So, or is there, have you yeah. dropped a few? Good question. I try really hard not to make this thing about 706, right? I try really hard not to make this about setting aside regulations. My 
entire focus for this talk, this paper based on also, if you want to read it by the same title, is about what level of deference we just afforded. Um, it's entirely possible that I can say that even without giving Trump deference and bump stocks, the regulation is still good. It's not arbitrary and capricious. It's still possible we can get there. I don't think it is. So I, I try really hard not to ground my analysis in arbitrary and capricious. But I can tell you, um, if one of these regulations combines a reversal, a discovery, that, in my mind, is a pretty good indication that the statute cannot bear that construction, and it probably goes into A and C land. So, a very good question. Yeah. So, I want to zero in on some sort of the evidence question about sort of what, um, how we determine when a president's been involved in, in crafting these things. Yeah. Because, you know, the Ninth Circuit got, you know, sort of pilloried in the press about sort of citing President Trump's tweets about, yeah, right. about the, you know, uh, DACA rescission. And my understanding of sort of your, your premise is that that's perfectly fine. Like they need to do that in order to understand that he was that he was the one involved in this. Because I mean, going back to Brown and Williamson, the court didn't do that, but still came out to the same conclusion, um, just because they used legisl like legislative history and then sort of analysis. So sort of where is your line about this extrinsic evidence of President Look, statements? I am the OG for extrinsic evidence, right? <laughs> I was I was arguing that you can cite President statements before it was cool. But here, here's an important point, though, right? In the context, and I'm going to talk about the travel ban, this might be part of the talk for tomorrow, right? In the context of where a rational basis review, right, which I think the travel ban has to be in, for reasons I can maybe discuss later, this extrinsic evidence is irrelevant. When you're dealing with an administrative agency action, I do think it is relevant. Um, it's true, it's not in the record, so to speak, right? It's not in the administrative record. Um, but I think what this evidence does is it speaks to the manner in which uh, the regulation came about. Now, generally, we just don't know, right? Before Twitter, Bill Clinton didn't exactly tweet his thoughts on, you know, tobacco. He gave a speech in the Rose Garden that was nice. But what we do see um, in reporting are disgruntled bureaucrats who speak to the press. I'm hesitant to have courts even cite these things. Those things I think are dangerous. But when the president himself makes a speech to the public, right? For example, President Obama says over and over again, I don't have the power to help the dreamers, right? That's a public speech. He's given it, by my count, a dozen times of the same exact thing. I think courts can take notice that the head of the executive branch made a comment on that. Um, I, I don't think it's inappropriate. In fact, I, I've been, it's just hilarious. I've been arguing this for years, and all these people are saying, no, you can't quote Obama, and then they quote every tweet every five seconds, whatever Trump tweets. It's, it's a bizarre surreality for me. But I think you can take cognizance that the head of the executive branch who supervises the person issuing this regulation made some comments. Um, I don't think it's problematic to do that. And I do think it does cast doubt that when the executive says, I can't do this, and then suddenly when a bill is defeated, oh, I can do this now. I think that, that, that you can perhaps factor into the 706 A and C analysis. I think you can. Um, but just bear with me. In the context of national security, where we have not a complete picture of what's going on, to cite a tweet about Trump and some God knows what, I think I think creates problems. And I can maybe talk about this tomorrow. I think we are talking about this tomorrow, right? About the yeah. uh, presidential speech. Uh, so yeah. I'll, I'll save some that for tomorrow. But I think you can do it. Uh, not always, but I think you can do it. Uh, I don't want to intrude too much on your talk for tomorrow, but I do have a question about sort of our analysis when there's initial evidence of presidential involvement. So I imagine sort of there's two ways this can be done. One, you just have a heightened standard that's applicable from the beginning when you're analyzing the action. Or you might say there's initially a heightened standard, but that there's things the agency can do that can return us to a more deferential posture in analyzing the conduct. And I was wondering, do you see perhaps any analogy in other classes of cases where there's maybe that initial skepticism, but I guess the presumption that it's not a proper action can be rebutted such that the level of deference originally applicable is applicable anew? Well, that's a good question. I, I haven't thought about it in those terms, right? So the question is, what if you start off with heightened scrutiny and then X happens and then you reverse the presumption? Um, you know, generally in terms of the Chevron doctrine, once you get to Chevron deference, you're home free. Right? Once you get to the reasonable standard of Chevron step two, you win. 
Um, I don't think there's any way to rebut that presumption. So really, it's that the first step do you get there. Is the statute ambiguous or not? Um, I don't go so far to say that once you have evidence of this maladministration, the president loses and you go to this basically like a strict scrutiny standard. I don't, I, don't, I don't go there, but what I do say is it should be enough to prevent the application of the sort of uber Chevron de deference, right? You know, maybe just not quite a de novo review, but something between de novo and Chevron, whatever that happens to be. But if you have, if you have these, these specters, these, these indicia of, of maladministration, you don't go full Chevron. <coughs> That I'd be okay with stopping there. I don't know how much further I want to go than that. But, but, but good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I guess I'll make this one pretty open ended. Um, so, beyond Justice Gorsuch being um, skeptical of Chevron, mm -hmm. you know, there's a sense it, inchoately that the courts are starting to take a more skeptical eye at this, even though increasingly the courts have Republican appointees on them, and it is a Republican administration. So that kind of is an exception to the normal dance switching rule, uh, maybe. Um, but how do you think this will play out, if at all, um, in the you know in both the circuit courts and then then on the Supreme Court? Right. So this is this is a million dollar question, right? You got Justice Thomas, who's been skeptical of the Chevron doctrine for some time. And you have Judge Gorsuch, you have Justice Gorsuch, who was written before, they skeptical of Chevron. And then you need three more. Um, so under the normal circumstances, you would expect conservative judges to defer to a conservative president. Uh, what I think and hope will happen at some point is that Gorsuch and Thomas will not give Trump the deference that perhaps it would otherwise be. I mean, it could be a weird opinion with, you know, Gorsuch, Thomas, Ginsburg, son of Aaron Kagan, right? It could be that that's the majority opinion giving deference to the executive, I'm sorry, uh, uh, not giving deference to Trump. Um, I think the travel land case might actually have some deference in there as well. It, it's baked in there. I'll maybe talk about it tomorrow a little bit. Um, but what, what I think we'll probably see is not a wholesale reversal of Chevron, but um, an application of what's called the major question doctrine. And this is something I've written about in my Harvard Law Review piece. Um, what the major question doctrine suggests is that there are certain issues that are such major importance like major question, that Congress would not have let the agency do this in silence. Scalia phrased it the best way, that Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes, right? That if Congress wanted the agency to do X, they would have told them to. So use the tobacco case, right? If Congress wanted to give the FDA the power to regulate tobacco, they would have said so. If Congress wanted to give uh, uh, the power to um, you know, regulate some really big thing, they would have said so. Uh, I can see this as a Chevron set zero type analysis where it's of a, such a great, such a gravity that unless Congress spoke to it clearly, um, we would presume silence. So you don't even get to the deference issue now. So say, isn't Josh? Isn't that the non-delegation doctrine? Close, right? Uh, it, it's what they call a delegation avoidance canon. The idea is well, if we interpret the statute the way the agency wants, it may run afoul of the delegation principle. So we'll just say you don't get to do it. The end result's the same. Agency loses, right? You don't have to bring back Chef to poultry and the, and the ivory back. This is a case not too far. Lower East Side, we're really close here, right? Yeah, Brooklyn, right across the river. Um, but then you have Chef to poultry issue. So uh, to answer your open ended question with an open ended answer, um, I, I think at some point we will see some delegation come back to the court. They granted a case for next term on SORNA. This is the Sex Offender Registry Notification Act, I think, at the acronym, right? SORNA. And the issue here is the Attorney General is given the power to designate people sex offenders without much guidance at all. And a lot of courts have suggested this might have problems, or <coughs> as well, and they granted cert on this question. So you could actually see in a criminal law case, the court puts some teeth into delegation. That, I think, would be important. So I mean, delegation deference are two sides of the same coin, right? This is why major question is important. If Congress didn't delegate the power in the first place, then you'll get to the deference question. So before you get to deference, de Chevron deference, de <laughs> before you get to deference, deference, Chevron deference, right, you still have to do the initial threshold question of step zero, is there a delegation in the first place? And this is where I think the court might do some damage. Put some points to the board. If you go to yesterday's New York Times, we quoted at, at this point uh, about the new administrative litmus test, right, that used to be the litmus test was Roe v. Wade. And what I said in the Times was, I think gay marriage is more or less settled, I think abortion is more or less settled. With admin law, you can actually do stuff. And according to the New York Times, I spoke to the reporter there, uh, some length, quoted me one sentence for a 30 interview, that's how it works. Um, according to the Times, 
the, the, the White House is looking for judges with admin law, right? Not Roe v. Wade, not a vertical. What's your position on Chevron? And that's where you make a long-standing effect. The cultural issues, I think, are basically dead. I think those are, you know, whatever. I mean, at the margin, Rifra, maybe the nuns get a victory right now, and then most sisters are poor. But I think admin is where you actually make some progress. So this is slightly a more you know predictive core thing as well, but it, it seems to me <coughs> obvious that your framework of the four prongs, whatever, range from kind of most you know clear cut, easy to tell to hard yeah, to tell. Yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, would you see a court? You know, would it be acceptable for a court to say, all right, we can tell when the president, you know, presidential election happened. Everyone knows. Harder to tell when you know Obama's making phone calls or posting a YouTube video. So look, would that affect the? Yeah. Impact of it. Look, the question is on discovery, and I don't mean presidential, I mean like civil procedure discovery. There was actually a federal court in, was in San Francisco, yeah, Judge Bork, who ordered the White House to turn over communication logs about correspondence between the White House and the agencies about the Oscar rescission. Sc SCOTUS mandamus that, right? The court issued mandamus. It was actually a, a, a split opinion on the Court of Appeals, Judge Bork. Watford, Judge Watford actually dissented saying this is too much. And he's the Ginsburg clerk, right? The Supreme Court mandamus that and said, we can't allow courts to intrude upon the executive branch communications to find whether these phone calls took place. But let me tell you, I hypothesized about this. I didn't think judges would have the cojones to do it, but now with Trump, judges are up for the game. If you have a sort of a good faith technocrat in an agency, let's say there's a new, um, a new scientific <clears throat> finding that has at least a significant minority or is actually a, an emerging consensus mm -hmm. about, say, like some new finding about benzene. Um, and it looks like the agency is actually just going to revise a standard because of Science. Scientific Hashtag science, right? That, exactly. I have love science, right? Hashtag. Um, does that get more deference? And if so, is are, does your view sort of lend itself to a further, like a wall between the president and his agency? Oh, Would presidential question. fingerprints make that more yeah, difficult? Yeah, I see your question. So um, I'll answer your question two, two different ways. Sir. Let's say. The president announces that I think benzene is really bad, it's bad for the environment, it causes global warming, whatever, right? Science. And then it turns out that there's actually a science behind it. Maybe a mixed motive case, right? There's some maladministration, but there's some technocratic. And that's fine, I'm okay with that, right? How many parts per million, how many lines in the thing, whatever, the dots, right? That's fine. But what about a better example, right? Let's say that the civil servants tell the president, here's the best interpretation, interpretation of the statute. And then he overrules them, he says, nah. I'm going to go the other way. This is now census, right? Census Bureau. That um, apparently members, career civil servants in the Commerce Department told the Commerce Secretary, we don't need to ask about citizenship on the, um, on the census form because it will actually decrease uh, uh, returns. And then the Secretary overruled that. We usually don't know about that, but there was actually a report that the Secretary put out explaining it. And let me tell you, California AG sued within five seconds, and he sure as hell cited that. And he said that here the overruling career civil servants. Um, this happened during the Obama presidency also, where the IRS was asking, can we make these Obamacare payments, these subsidies? And uh, the, the guy's title is a chief risk officer. What a title, right? Who's the chief risk officer told the IRS commissioner, you can't do this. This puts us at risk of liability under the Anti-Deficiency Act. That's a statute that you can't spend money without appropriation. The commissioner said, thank you very much, I'm overruling you, right? Um, now, why do you say, well, who is this punk, right? The civil servant should tell the political appointee with the confirmation what to do. Uh, but the other side is, when you go to technocracy, or technocratic, whatever, te the technocratic argument, that guy actually is trying to do his job, and the political is trying to accomplish some mission. So to the extent this evidence gets out, uh, I think it does have relevance. And again, with the ATF and the bump stock thing, there's evidence that the ATF said, you can't do this, you can't regulate the bump stocks. And, but DOJ overruled them. I think that, that may have some bearing. Now, this goes deep state, right? You know, you're having this, 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 
this entrenched bureaucracy trying to thwart the president. Not going that far. Don't, 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 the new Dobbs is not that far away. Um, but uh, I've been in the show, so it's, it's fun. Um, but the question, the question is this, right? Uh, can courts take cognizance of this? I think the answer is they should. What else? Yes? Um, so given the fact that sort of data showing that Chevron is oftentimes used as a tool of convenience by judges to kind of get where they want to be anyway. Um, how much do you envision kind of other deferential considerations being part of that inherent process that's happening before step zero? Yeah, and, good question. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure is a very good point, right? Judges apply Chevron when they want to, and you can use various tools of construction to get to ambiguity, right? The, the threshold decision, um, I think where this matters at the margin is actually at step zero. In other words, I don't think they're going to reverse Chevron step two. That if you get to ambiguity, I think the reasonableness standard is probably okay. What they'll start saying is, well, this is such an important question, it's not for Congress to have decided. And if you beef up step zero, you have to worry about the step two. And the court hinted at this in the King v. Burwell decision a couple of years ago. This was about uh, a statute that said, Subsidies are available in the exchange established by the state. And okay, one would think that means an exchange is established by the state. The Obama administration said, no, 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 that means state or federal. And the court rejected Chevron deference. They said, no, that, that's not ambiguous, right? And they went a step further and they said, this was such an important question, paying all these billions of dollars. We don't think Congress would have left such a precise statute to fit that broad umbrella. Then John Roberts broke my heart and did what he did. But they rejected the Chevron argument. And I think they have basically a major question now. Major question, you could say. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So, to go back to what Jack and you were discussing a minute ago, it occurs to me as you guys were talking that there may be a collision between two anti administrative uh, state lines that are currently being fleshed out. One is what you were saying that it's illegitimate for the, under certain circumstances, it may be illegitimate for the uh, political office holder or appointees to interfere with legitimate technocratic interpretations. But the other is the line that you see in you know, the, the people who decry sensational smiles and the, the people who, like Randy Barnett, are generally skeptical of rational basis review, saying that you know, when a group of technocrats gets together and decides yes. suddenly that no one in New York can whiten teeth unless they've gone to dental school, even though it doesn't really need that or whatever, that, that you know, the, the so-called technocratic claim behind that, in fact, is kind of bunk. Um, Hashtag science. Yeah, <laughs> and so I mean, but that, that seems like on the one hand you have a bunch of well-meaning righties uh, saying uh, no deference to the technocrats, and then then also trying to say at the same time no no deference to the political <laughs> point piece when they're they're overriding. So we just go who, who's John Galt? I mean, is that the answer? We just <laughs> sure. By the way, in today's New York Times, I don't know, so yesterday Justice Stevens had this op-ed saying we need to reveal his second nuts, but today they published letters to the editor. One of them. It was John Galt from Texas. <laughs> they published a letter from John Galt from Texas. Does the New York Times have any? Did anyone at the time realize it was a obvious joke? <laughs> and he's called the J O N, not J O H N Galt or whatever. I'll, I'll let it slide. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in disclosure, I'm Randy Burnett's uh, co-author on a case. We wrote a book together. Uh, Randy's a little bit more pro lockier than I am. I'm not quite fully there. I'm more of a Harlan guy. Um, but. The point is, okay, so we have option A, politicos are deciding, option B, deep states decide, right? The bureaucrats, <laughs> right? Is one better than the other? <sighs> Let me explain it like this. I'll fight one battle at a time. If I'm within the battle of the administrative state, I'm gonna take on Chevron. If you want me to battle the administrative state, I'll say, you know, no 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 Brandeis briefs, right? No, no Mulvers Oregon briefs, right? Um, Go back to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. 1866, that is, yeah. But one, one battle at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Um, <laughs> anything else? For those who are interested in this topic, particularly the travel ban section, I know most of the room knows some of you are involved in it, but we have an all day conference tomorrow, of which Josh is one of the speakers. Um, in Lipton Hall from 9.30 in the morning to uh, 4 in the afternoon with uh, really an all-star cast. So the, the first panel at 9.30 is 
uh, Dean Morrison moderating Michael McConnell, uh, Jillian Metzger, and Adam White. Second panel is at 11 10. 11 10? Yeah. 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 Uh, with with uh, Josh Blackman, um, uh, Sam Estreicher, and um, Bauer. Bob Bauer. Thank you. And the third panel is um, is at 12 4, no, uh, 1 10. And that is uh, um, Jamil Jaffer, um, uh, Sam Zakharoff, and um, Catherine Powell on foreign affairs. So it's it's going to be fantastic. I've heard uh, of none of those people. <laughs> he's the uh, he's the editor in chief of the Journal of Law and Liberty. I'll so, go. Uh, <laughs> ex ex we we we've communicated. Yes. So, okay. Okay. No name tag. Um, and keynote by uh, keynote Judge by, McKenzie. Yeah. So thank you all so much. And if you have questions, welcome to come up and ask.